so far. Wow. Uh, it is good to see everyone this morning. I'm noticing guests in the audience this morning, so uh, what we usually do to start our service is we sing a song. So if you'd like to rise or take a comfortable position, uh, we're going to sing a song this morning to start off. And uh, we've got a pretty wide variety of songs this morning, so hopefully we'll play something that you like. Uh, we're going to start it off with There's Power in the Blood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. couldn't see the little guys over here. They had it going on. Praise God. Amen. I was kind of jealous. My legs won't let me do that anymore, but <laughs> still look fun. Yes. Good? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see everybody this morning. I praise the Lord for each one of you. And guys, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I come before you and I thank you for such a beautiful day. The sun is shining. The grass is green. I, I see all these children over here dancing in your house, Lord God, and praising your name. Father, I can't think of any more of what it would be like even. I know it's going to be better in heaven, but it's so nice right now to be with brothers and sisters and, and see such joy around us. God, I lift this service to you and may it be a testimony of your grace and of your power and of your glory, Lord God, today. And may we put forth your word in such a fashion that each one of us will leave here today knowing that we have stood in your presence, Lord God. Speak to us, whether it be through a song, through the scripture reading that David's going to share, through the message, whatever it is. But may we leave here today realizing you are God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. If there's anyone that has never bowed that knee and accepted that in their life, if they've never truly chosen to give their life over to you, whatever the reason may be, may we not try to judge it or put it to this way or that way, but understand that you are the one who saves, and may they put their faith in you before it's too late. God, I just lay this whole service at your feet. Thank you for this praise team behind me, for these little guys over here, and all my brothers and sisters that are singing back. May we truly make a joyful noise unto you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says? Amen. Amen. It's good seeing everybody this morning. Walk around a second. Shake somebody's hand. Give them a hug. And
Just a few announcements I want to share with you this morning, but they are important. So as we grab our seats and be rude to say and close our mouths, so I won't say that. <laughs> Seriously, guys, just a few announcements this morning. If you need uh, some of the simple stuff up front, someone was wondering about all the cards that are in the foyer. Remember over the, the, the last few months, we had a, a, a plethora of cards come in, just thousands and thousands of cards of people expressing their well wishes and their prayers onto us. And what we have been doing, there was, no, there was absolutely no way one person could read all those cards. And what we've been doing is taking, the, but we also didn't want to just throw them away. There was time and prayer and heart given into those cards. And what we have been doing is if people would like to take some of those cards and read them and, and thank and pray over them and keep them or do whatever you feel as though the Lord's to leading you to do with them. But that way, everybody, if anybody asks, did you read my card? I can say, I probably didn't. I might have. However, someone did. And, uh, and it's sharing their blessings with you guys. So those cards in the front, that's what those are. They are still some of the cards from all around the world. If you'd like to take some of those home with you, please grab some on your way out. Um, there's a couple of things I want to lift up to the survivors. One of which is the uh, Blue Bonnet Parade is going to be coming up very, very shortly here this coming Saturday. Uh, Miss Julie Dahlberg over here on the end is heading that up for me. She is, they are putting, there's going to be a float in the Blue Bonnet Parade to honor the survivors. Any survivors that would like to go and be in the float, on the float for the parade, please give it Julie and let her know if, if that's something that you would like to do. Um, there was something else, but I'm just going to grab a few more things here that I think I need to share. Uh, staff meeting today. Guys, if you're on staff, we're going to meet at Jack's. Uh, Wendy printed up the menu so you can already know what you want when you get there. We're welcome to stay as long as we want, but the kitchen closes at 2. So we got to get there in time to order our lunch and get that done prior to. So she's got menus so you can know what you want when you get there. Uh, so that's today, approximately 1.30 when we get out of here and get over there. Also, next weekend, we're in for a treat. Next weekend, the, uh, the choir, the Joyful Singers, are coming from Alabama. They are on a tour, and they asked if they could come down here and sing for us. So they're going to have the entire morning service after Sunday school. They're going to be set up in here, and we're going to be blessed with the, the choir from, it's uh, Hartsville. Oh, uh, I can't remember the church right now. Hunter's Green, I think it is. But a church in Alabama is sending their choir. It's a very large choir that goes on tour every year, and they're coming to share with us next Sunday morning. So come and be, be, uh, be ready to be blessed through that. Um, what else? Oh, one more thing to put out there. It's in your bulletin, but I want to make sure we understand the a very important aspect. On May 5th, as the six-month anniversary of the tragedy, we are going to be gathering out here and we are going to have a memorial to honor those that, that have gone and the survivors. And then it's going to transition into a groundbreaking ceremony. So it's an all day on the grounds here that Saturday, May 5th. But the part I want to sub submit to you guys that I believe is incredibly important. From 9 o'clock to approximately 11, somewhere around there, to me this is one of the most important aspects of the day. Uh, Ted Elmore is putting together a prayer walk. We're going to prayer walk our new property. There's going to be stations. He's going to give us guides, kind of not tell you what to pray, but ideas of what to pray and how to pray. And then we're going to consecrate the ground with broken bread in the body of Christ. We're going to pour out wine, juice for the blood of Christ. And then we're going to anoint with oil or the spirit of Christ. And we're going, before we do anything for groundbreaking or anything like that, we want to make sure that that property that we have been blessed with is prayed over by the saints. Amen. So, amen. So if you can be here from 9 o'clock to approximately 11 o'clock that day at least, that is when we are going to incorporate corporately one body. We are going to be at different places all around that property and transition around it. But let's pray over that property and let's consecrate it for the Lord. You know, 50, 75, 100 years from now we'll be gone but our children or our children's children will still know this ground was consecrated for Jesus Christ, regardless of what anyone else says. Amen. And I want to make sure you're able to be a part of that. So if you can be here 9 o'clock that, that Saturday morning, you may say, I can't stay for the, the meal and the, 
the, the sermon and the, we were going to ring the bell 26 times. There's a lot of stuff in plans. You may not be able to stay for that, but try to come to that prayer walk. Let's consecrate that ground for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Okay, I think that's enough announcements for me. There's a bunch more in your Bible, uh, in your Bible, in your, um, in your thingy, the bulletin, the bulletin. Uh, make sure you read those if you would, guys. Okay, David. Oh, David's over here now. Come on up, brother. Poor Shane, they pushed you to the back last week, now they don't even give you a chair? <laughs> Father God, I do lift up my brother to you right now and ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you just give him your grace, your power, and God, thank you for who he, you are in him. May we hear you through him and may you bless his family for his willingness to come and, and do the scripture reading this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. I like that shirt, man. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I found out a long time ago that Jesus is someone that we can enjoy. And the, the uh, ebbs and flow of life uh, take us to some super highs. And then sometimes they can take us to some super lows. And I found that uh, I found that words of encouragement can lift people up so well. Amen. I told uh, I want to say that again. I told our Thursday night dinner and uh, scripture working on uh, Thursday was a couple of weeks ago that I walked in for my therapy and uh, I was having a tough day. It doesn't make any difference what it was, but I was pretty down. And the guy in the wheelchair is wheeling himself out. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I'd just like to tell you this. He's a uh, parachuted out and his parachute collapsed about the last 50 feet. And he fell and broke everything. He's been a couple of years rehabbing on this. And he's, he's getting there. He, he's going to be well one day. But he's a real rough individual. And I don't go around in there saying, praise God, praise God. I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't do that, but I do talk about God everywhere I go. And that's not an exception to be in that place. I just walked by him and said, I might have said hi. He goes, hey, 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 hold on a minute. And he, 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 he looked at me and he said these words. He said, uh, why, uh, when I said, when he asked me, how are you doing? I just said something like, I'm fine. He says, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. He says, how are you doing spiritually? Wow. Well, you know, I'm kind of having a tough day, but he goes, he says, I, I, I'd like to be able to tell you exactly what he said. I just can't remember that, but he said, uh, well, uh, you're always encouraging everybody, and I, uh, I can see you're down a little bit, but uh, it'll get better. Everything will be okay. You know? I'm not going to sit here and say he doesn't know God, but he doesn't talk like he knows God most of the time. But that, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this word that Frank used to use all the time. He doesn't use it very often anymore. He used to talk, he used to talk about the, the Shania glory of God. Amen. And it doesn't mean that I'm walking around with this glow, but I do have one inside. And, and that is the glow that God has given me for a second chance in life. Okay? And I'm bringing this up because I'm, I'm bringing this up because I want to read. I, I never miss telling her. Our favorite book. Okay. Bear with me as I read this. In James chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships for an example. 
Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Whatever the pilot wants and wherever to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue, our tongue, the tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body, it corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. I want us to hear this last part, please. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made of God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brother, should this not be? Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James is really, I got myself so cotton mouth right now. I'm so, I'm so, I'm not hurt for me. I'm hurt for those that our tongues hurt. I'm hurt because as Christians, we are to live by a higher standard. And it doesn't mean just to be a man and not ask questions. You know, last night, I got on Facebook, and I, I looked everywhere in there for the delete button, and I couldn't find it. All I could find was a deactivate. I, de I deactivated my Facebook, and then I turned around, and I found out how to take the icon off my phone so I don't have to look at it. And, and I'm only saying that because Facebook doesn't hurt people. Our tongues hurt people. Amen. Our tongues who put things in there. And I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. But I promise you, when things are said that are so untrue and people's lives are in the balance, who are we hurting? Who are we hurting and why are we doing that? My daughter and I listened to a song. Uh, on the way to church this morning. <coughs> what song did we listen to, honey? I'm not dead. Amen. That's right. We listened to another song after that, The Fruit of the Spirit. And I ask you these questions. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and the last one, self-control. I read James 1 to you, or excuse me, James 3, because where is self-control? Where is the need that we just got to have this information or got to know or whatever it may be? Where is our self-control? You know, I don't know if he put it last so it's the last thing we remember or if he put it last because he didn't think it was that important. I don't have that answer, but it's there. Self-control. Where is our self-control? You know, I sound like I'm preaching to you and I apologize for that. I'm just trying to open our hearts first, our minds second. So those two things control what's in, in the middle of our mouths. And you're looking at someone that's made a lot of mistakes. And the word perfect a while ago, I'm far from. I love my pastor. There's nothing in between with a but. I love my pastor's wife. As a man should love a, 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 another man's wife in Christ, I love these people. And I hurt when they hurt. Amen. So I encourage you, as I read this scripture, it's right there for you to see. I didn't make something up. Self-control, kindness, gentleness. Where's the kindness and gentleness in those words that we read? Where's the kindness? Where is the kindness? There is none. You know, Frank talks about sanctifying this ground out here that a woman walked and prayed. The sweetest, gentlest, kindest woman I ever met was probably Miss Carla. Amen. And she prayed for that land. And that land was given to us. Just because she asked for it. I know you've heard that before. So I ask you all to, to, to walk in her steps of sweetness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control.
morning that we will continually just lift up your great name for you were slain for us and you chose to do that. Father, may your will be done this day in Jesus name. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. If you've been blessed already this morning, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles this morning, let me give David his. If you throw it at people, that's a pretty, pretty hefty one to throw. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of John. Mm. The book of John. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. As you're turning there this morning, Dwight Pentecost, is, he's written many books, but in his book, uh, it's a commentary actually on the book of Philippians. He shares the story in that book about uh, a church split, the occurrence of a church split that transpired up in Dallas, Texas. And in that story, I wanted to relay that story to you just a little bit. The church split was so bad that it, it, it ended up becoming a legal suit of one side of the church suing the other side of the church as to who actually owned the church. Now that sounds odd, but that case went all the way to the state Supreme Court trying to figure out what side of the church owned the church. Now the case was dismissed in the Supreme Court because they did not want to get into the inner workings, the inner issues of the church and said that, that the, a denominational church governing body needed to decide this. And it ended up that the matter was finally settled by one side giving ownership rights to the other side of that church. Now, during that period of time, as you can only possibly imagine, the local news was having a heyday. The news people, people were just loving every minute of that, and they were soaking this up. But there was an investigative reporter who did some investigating to see what initially started this feud, what initially started such a notorious division within the church. Well, what he found out was that apparently one of the church elders was offended when his portion of food given to him was not as large as the young person that was sitting beside him. Now we, yeah, that, that, you heard that correctly. All that uproar was caused over such an incredibly petty thing. He was offended over something so petty as the portions of his food. And he allowed Satan to come in, and kind of like David just spoke to just a little bit ago, and, and allowed Satan to come in and start to divide people, and it, it, it just kept growing and growing and growing till it became what it was. It is no wonder that the, the world looks at churches and never wants anything to do with them or Christianity when we continually go out and lower ourselves to the ways of the world. As David pointed out just a little bit earlier, we have been called to a higher countenance, guys. We are not to lower ourselves to the ways of Satan, for he who is within us is greater than he who is within this world. Amen? But yet, when we choose to do so, Satan is going to jump all over that. The message this morning that I feel as though that God has impressed on my heart is one that, that we need to continue to understand and grow in as Satan continues to attack. You know, we were under attack prior to the tragedy. The tragedy, I think he thought, was a final uh, play there. And when that didn't work, he continues to attack, folks. Satan is actively pursuing and, and attacking the church. But praise God, the good news there, and the guys, it is good news. The good news is for him to be so powerfully and relentlessly attacking, then we must be doing some good spiritual bottom kicking. We must be doing what God has called us to do. Or which Satan would pass on by and leave us alone. But as we recognize that, as we acknowledge that, as we continue to move forward as what God has called us to be, we need to also remember what Jesus said, that a house divided upon itself cannot stand. In other words, as the church, and I'm not just saying our, just our body, I'm talking to our body, but the church in general, if you will, we must understand the importance of church unity with Christ at the head. 
It is Christ who's at the forefront of anything we do, not me. Now, I want to make sure we comprehend and understand that. I am just a man like anyone else. I have my own faults. I have my own sins. I have my weaknesses. I have my times I have to go before the Lord and say, God, please shut my mouth because I'm having a hard time doing it. And I have to go before Christ. You are not to follow me. Praise God. He has allowed me to be the shepherd the, over this flock. And I praise God for that. I praise God for each one of you guys that God has allowed me to study and share with. But bottom line, a church that's driven by the pastor is a church that's driven by the world. A church has to be driven by Christ. And when Christ is at the forefront, then that church is going to go the direction it should go. Sure, we got many personalities with the pastor and everyone else. But when we allow Christ to be at the forefront, you know what happens? All those personalities are gathered together and God's going to use those personalities from Paul, the, the, the academic, to Peter, the fisherman. He's going to use them all to garner and build his kingdom because they're all, even though spread out, are following one goal, one direction, and that's Jesus Christ. We must be unified behind Christ. In John chapter 17, notice what he says there in verse 11. I am no longer in the world, but they are, they, speaking of us, they are in the world. This is Jesus now praying. But and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by your name. That's why we're called Christians, guys. We are under the blood of Christ. We are protected by Christ. I don't care what Satan says and what he insinuates and what he tries to manipulate us into thinking. I am a child of the king regardless of what anyone does, says, or insinuates. I am a joint heir to the throne of God and so are you if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And in so doing, Jesus says, protect them by your name so that they may be one as we are one. We are to be unified under the name of Jesus Christ. Keep them under thy name, the name which, which, which thou hast given me, Jesus. Keep them under that name so that they may be one as we are one. Think about that. How is God one? What does that mean? Folks, the, the, the Trinity demonstrates perfect unity God, unity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Encourager. They are one. They are never going to contradict one another. They're never going to go against one another. Three separate entities, but as one, continually led by God the Father. They're, all three are one, and Jesus says that we as the church, and he's asking the Heavenly Father, help unify them as we are unified. We should be coming together behind Jesus. We, we have differences. There can be differences of opinion, just like my brother shared just a few minutes ago. And we can discuss those, and we can sit and we can debate doctrinal issues here and there, but as long as every one of us that's accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior puts our eyes on God the Father and due to the best of our indiv ability individually and corporately to what God has called us to do, then we are going to be running in the same direction and the tailwind is going to soak up and pull up everything else with it. And before you know it, we are that lighthouse on the hill in Wilson County because we chose not to po focus on this or that. We chose not to focus on the world or the accusations. We we choose to focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. And we unify. Amen. Hallelujah. We unify behind Christ. The church is to be like the Trinity with its unity, willing to do whatever it is God has called us to do, individually or corporately, thereby working together to build the body. That's what we've been called to do, guys. He said, go ye therefore make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every one of us, not just a pastor, not just a deacon, not just an elder. Every one of us has been called to go forth and proclaim the gospel. Why? To build the kingdom. Why? Because God said, I desire that none should perish. No, not one. Even our enemies. We have been called to love our enemies and share the gospel and pray for them. And we will be able to do that. We'll be able to do so when we as one body unify and let Christ protect us under his name. You know, I was likened this past week to, a, I won't say names, but to a feel-good preacher. And I thought that rather humorous because, sure, I, I do believe that we can have joy. We are to have joy and have it abundantly. But 
I, am share, I have shared and will share and continue to share, folks, that we are in the midst of a spiritual battle. You will never hear me tell you, pie in the sky, everything's great, and you'll never have to fight a battle. That's not what Jesus said. He said that I have come and I have conquered the world. Be of good cheer for I have conquered the world. I have come to give you life and have it more abundantly. Praise God. But he also said just as I have been persecuted, so shall you also and more so. The battle is real. The battle rages. The battle is going on. Satan does not care to, to allow us to promote and continue to grow the kingdom of God. The battle is real. I am not going to preach a feel-good message to you, but what I can tell you feels good is to know that he who is with you is greater than he is within this world. Therefore, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I can have a smile on my face and still go out and fight the battle that God's called me to fight. And how much greater to fight knowing that we are unified together. God never said it would be easy. He never said all this pie-in-the-sky stuff. Be of good cheer, but he said, man... It's going to be hard, but I've already won the victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have already been given the victory when we choose not to focus on a man, not to focus on a denominational name, not to focus on a building. When we choose independently, then corporately to bind ourselves together one with another and corporately say that Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior, my guide, my lead, my holy Savior. When we do that as one body, then we have victory. As long as we stay behind Christ, the victory is ours through him. That's what we need to focus on. It's so easy sometimes. As, as David said, we're human beings. We have emotions. And sometimes we get down. And that's a, let me guarantee you, that's when Satan's going to attack. And it's so easy sometimes to give in to the, re, the things in this world and say, well, that must be reality. But reality is what this book says. And this reality says that in the end, my God wins. Amen. And he's given us the opportunity to be part of that ministry. Paul had concern. For the churches. That, that was one of his number one concerns. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you remember one, verses 1 through 4, and a little bit later in that same chapter, he says, I am afraid perhaps that when I come among you, I'm going to find, I'm going to find you not as I wish. Perhaps there is strife, jealousy, angry tempers, debates, slander, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. He lists those things down there. What is he saying? I'm afraid that when I come to the church, you should be unified behind Christ. You should be sharing the gospel. But, but maybe there's jealousy there. Maybe there's some angry tempers. There's some debates. There's some slanders. There's some debate uh, gossips. He says there's disturbance. There's arrogance. Paul understands that this is the human nature. And he's trying to tell the Corinthian church. And he tells the Ephesians church the same thing in chapter 4. He tells the Philippians church the same thing in chapter 4 of Philippians Coincidentally, also, he says the same thing. He's telling them, guys, get away from the jealousy of one another. Get away from the angry tempers. Get away from the debates. Get away from all the slander and the gossip and the disturbances and the arrogance. And put Christ back in your life because you must be unified behind Christ. It is then when the world attacks, you'll be strong. That's right. Amen. Amen. That stands just as firmly today. We must put Christ back at the front. As long as we keep putting people, or as you said, Facebook at the front, that's going to be our guide, and that's going to be our lead, and it's going to destroy us. We need to put Christ back at the front. We need to put Jesus at the head of our lives and say, God, what would you have me to see? Paul knew that disunity destroys churches. Disunity grieves the Holy Spirit. It tears the Spirit down. The Holy Spirit wants to work as one, building the kingdom of God and using different personalities to do it. The Holy Spirit within you wants to bear witness with the Holy Spirit within David, myself, Sherry, uh, whomever. It, the Holy Spirit wants to draw upon itself. The Holy Spirit wants to unite one to another and together grow with Christ. That's what Jesus meant when he said that unity that we have, I want them to have. Now you may say, well, that sounds impossible. Folks, if we are trusting the same God, truly, you know, when we say Lord, that means I've given him everything. He's my Lord. When we as a body have truly surrendered our lordship over to Jesus Christ, then we have won. 
Satan, though, his major objective is to cause disunity. His major objective is to come in and try to divide the church. And it's our mission not to allow that to happen. Divide and conquer is one of the oldest and best strategies of any war. And make no mistake, Satan is at war with us. And if he can divide us, then he knows he can conquer us. But as long as we stay unified behind Christ, and this is why Jesus made sure this prayer was said, made sure it was put into our scriptures so that you and I can read it. When we stay unified under God, Satan doesn't have a chance. As your pastor, let me say this morning, I pray for church unity. Always have. I pray for church unity during the hard times. However, true motivation for church unity comes from inside. Each one of us individually. Motivation for church unity cannot be created by external forces. I cannot make people love one another. But the Bible says, Jesus says, you'll know my people by the love they have for one another. That in other words, you know when Jesus said that we are to die to self? He wasn't saying that we are to literally physically die. What he was saying was, when that person hurts your feelings, die to self. Let it roll off and keep them looking for me. Keep loving that person for me. When that, when that person shoots down your idea, don't get your feelings hurt. Let it roll off. Die to self. Put the arrogance to the side, as Paul said, and keep living for Christ and love that brother or sister in Christ. When that person has a misunderstanding, maybe they called you a bad name. Dying to self means don't allow your pride and arrogance to drive you. Die to self and lift up Christ. And you know what's going to happen when all the brothers and sisters start dying to self, putting their pride and their arrogance and everything to the side and start looking to Christ and saying, God, I don't understand that, but you do. I want to pray for that brother or sister. I don't want to hate them. I don't want to shoot them down. I don't want to stomp on their toes in retaliation. I want you to, to, to work in here and show me some understanding. Show me what I need to do here. When we start loving our brothers enough to do that, Jesus said, you'll know those are my people. Amen. And folks, if God be for you, who can be against you? I'd love, I hope and pray that when my God's sitting in the throne and in heaven and he's talking to the angels and all those that have gone before us, I hope he looks down and says, those people down there in Southern Springs, look at them. Those are my people. I know why. Because look at the love they have for one another. They're following me and they're sharing the gospel. That kind of unity, guys, has to be heartfelt. It has to come from the inside. I, I thought of an illustration. Let's say that... that these marbles in this bag are people. Let's see if I can do this without losing my marbles. Ah, sorry. Bad, I know. These marbles are unified right now. But they're unified by an outside force. In other words, somebody is charismatic. Somebody who can speak and trying to unify people. And these marbles are unified. But you know what's the problem with these unified marbles? Is when it gets hard. When they meet some kind of obstruction. When there's, when, where the rubber meets the road, when there's people that come around and start pulling and, and everything. External things cannot keep uni unity. And external motivation is not going to keep unity. Because when there is not unity in the heart, when things get hard, people are going to start abandoning ship. When, if there's no unity coming from the heart, it's just about me. I'm going to save me. I don't care about my brother anymore. Yet Jesus said, you'll know my people by the love they have for one another. If it's only held together by external unity, what happens is, after a while, everybody falls apart. The external does not hold. But, let's say that there's Christians. And these Christians, they hit the same kind of adversity. They hit the same kind of adversity. They're in the same boat. But what happens? They hit that adversity, everything's rough, but because they have an internal idea, because they don't know about this self-righteous stuff, even in the adversity, they adhere to the one. That magnet is Jesus Christ. If I am focused on Christ, and my brothers and sisters are focused on Christ, you know what's going to happen? Even in the adversity, not only are we going to go in there together, but we're going to keep picking up more. Now, every now and then, one may fall away. Because they weren't focused on that magnet of Jesus Christ. But those who were focused, even tentatively, look at this little guy hanging on to that guy, hanging on to that guy. They were still brought together by Christ. Pardon? Prayer warriors. Absolutely. Those are prayer warriors holding on to those little guys. That's right. 
What I'm trying to illustrate here, guys, is when we have the internal motivation, that magnet of Jesus Christ within us, not only am I going to be drawn to Christ in the trials, not only am I going to be drawn to Christ in the midst of the situations, not only am I going to be drawn to Christ in the good times and the bad times and everything in between, but so are my brothers and sisters who are also drawn to Christ. And when we're all drawn together, look what direction we're all going. We may be pointing all kinds of funky directions, but we're still going wherever Christ goes. Why? Because we didn't try to do an external thing. Oh, it's Church of Sutherland Springs. That's what's going to hold us together. Folks, this church does not hold us together. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is an internal decision that each one of us has to make. Each one of us has to choose. Each one of us has to decide where and how and what am I going to put my faith in? Is it an external force or is it going to be in that internal force? A right relationship with Jesus Christ. Please listen to this. this is what I'm trying to say this morning. If our relationship is right with Christ, it is going to lead with the right relationship with other believers. Because we're all going to come together to Christ. It comes down, am I, am I Christ-centered or am I self-centered? If I'm self-centered, then I, I'm not going to be drawn to other believers because I'm going to look out what's best for me. If it's best for me to join, go to the church today, great. If it's not, you know what? I'm going to go fishing. But if I'm Christ-centered, I'm going to be drawn to believers and together we're going to fight the battle. Every day. Doesn't mean we have to see each other. We got the power of prayer. As my brother just said, we can pray for one another. Lift up one another. There's a... Miss Helen's daughter is sitting, laying in a hospital bed in, in San Antonio. And I got to visit her a couple times this week. And just Friday I was there and her spirits are high. And I told her, I said, honey, there's a lot of people praying for you, some of which don't even know you. And she said, I know, I feel it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we continue to do that, when we continue to lift up those prayers, when we continue to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, folks, a worldly kind of love is not going to unify. A worldly kind of love says, I'm only going to love what is lovable. I'm going to love those who are close to me. No, God says we are to love one another regardless. God, folks, love, I say this in my premarital counseling oftentimes, love is not a feeling. Hollywood has made it a feeling. But love is actually an act of the will. Feelings come and go. They're high and low. It, but what did Christ do? Even when he hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He loved us enough to die upon that cross. Why? Because his love was a committed love, an internal desire to carry out the plan of God the Father, which brings salvation to all those who believe in him. His love was not about the feelings of the moment. He did not feel real good on that cross. But he was committed to love those that God loved. Amen. We are to make a commitment, folks. And we're to, do, we're to do that remembering that God's love is unconditional. Thank God he didn't put conditions on me. Thank God it's not based on how I feel. Because I'm pretty sure I've ticked off God quite a few times. But I know he still loves me. I know he still cares for me. We're to show acts of kindness, guys, even to our enemies. Believe me, I know from experience, especially here lately, that's a hard one. But you know, I, I, have, I have purposed in my heart just a few days ago. That I, one, I don't, I don't, I just, it's so much stuff that's not true, I just don't even look anymore. But now when it crosses my mind, even if it crosses my mind, I wonder, I stop and say, Father, I pray that each one of them will come to a saving grace of who you are. And I lift them up to the Lord. Now, you may be saying, I can't do that. That's not who I am. Praise God. The faster we admit we can't do it, the faster we can let go and let God do it. Amen. The faster we admit we're flawed, the faster we admit that we are not that strong, the faster God moves in. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, guys, this is what brings unity. You know what's, why we're, we have so much fun in worship? Why our hearts are lifted in song and these, these babies are running around and playing and, and, and you get joy from watching that? Because the Holy Spirit's being made manifest for you and I. Amen. We see it, we hear it, we can sing it and we can be a part of it. If you don't like singing now, you're going to have a hard time in glory. <laughs> we are going to be around that throne and that's what God don't have to preach messages to us anymore. We're not, we'll be sanctified at that point, which means we're just going to sing. And we're going to praise God. I mean, I don't know what all we're going to do, but it's going to, 
I, I almost guarantee you there's going to be a lot of singing going on. Because that's joy. That's fun. In fact, we might be bouncing around and running around like these little kids were because we're God's kids. Do they have tambourines up there? I bet they do. <laughs> I bet they do. We know they got harps. Why not? My sister, is my sister here? Uh, yep, there she is. So see, she'll, already have, she'll have experience on us when she gets up there. <laughs> Guys, we have to stay unified. Ask, you know, have you, consider, David, you, you, you hit it so well. We need to consider what our actions and what our words do and how it affects others in the church. We have to. We, we need to stop and understand. Have we let others' actions and words roll off of us as well? It's two ways. One, I need to watch my mouth. But you know, when my brother or sister says something dumb, which I'm prone to do, sometimes it's best to let it roll off and say, that was not cool. But you know what? My God still loves you, and so do I. Amen. When we will love one another the way Christ loves the church, then there's going to be an incredible report. We're going to be, do mighty things. We need to ask ourselves, have we repented of the, the things that Paul said? Have we repented of our our gossip? Have we repented of our slander? Have we tried to resolve dissension amongst others? Bottom line is this, folks. As we move forward as a body, Satan is going to continue to attack. And I would say, praise God, that's the way it's going to be. But let's stay unified. Let's build together the kingdom of God. Pray for one another, lift up one another, strengthen one another, call one another, the, the enemy is going to pull out no stops. So let's not pull out any stops either. Let's start calling each other. Let's pray for one another. Let's seriously lift up one another and bind together, not under the name of First Baptist Sutherland Springs, but under the name of Jesus Christ. If we allow Satan to divide and conquer, we have lost an incredible opportunity to be what God has called us to be in an hour that God has called us to be it. Why not just stand behind him and say, Lord, here I am. And, and please understand, I'm not asking you to follow a man. You pray, speak, tell us, you know, speak your opinions out there. That's how we grow. But may we do so continually following Christ together. There's no prima donnas in God's house. It's Jesus Christ. The pastor's no closer than anyone else to Christ. You're either saved or you're not. And let me say this morning... As your pastor, I am, I am rather proud to be looking ahead to the battle before us, knowing that, that Satan is planning this battle, knowing that if God be for me, who can be against me? Thank you, Jesus, that you've chosen to allow me to be a part of that battle. But even greater still, I want to share with you this morning, just as, as John said and in, in, in he was writing, he looked out and he said, man, what a great crowd of witnesses. I am proud as your pastor to be the shepherd of this flock. Amen. And I pray as a flock. Satan's trying to pick off the sheep on the edges. But as a flock, I think we're strong enough to protect them as well. Amen. Let's bind together in the name of Jesus Christ. And together with Christ, be the light of the house on the hill to share the gospel to Wilson County. I don't care what the world says. Let's tell them about Jesus. And what Jesus done for us. Amen. Now if you're here this morning. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's not about me. It's not about this church. My Lord and my Savior. Jesus Christ died those th many years ago. And he died on that cross. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it said, the Bible says. There is no remittance, remittance of sin. Without the shedding of blood. And Jesus Christ is the only one that fulfilled all the sacrificial requirements to shed that blood. But then it didn't stop there. He arose again three days later and he's shown himself to many, over 500 at one time. He's shown himself and said, whomsoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe that I am the son of God and I arose from the dead and you profess that with your mouth and believe it in your heart, so shall you be saved. One of our detractors said that I have become the leader of a cult. Guys, if that cult's name is Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, then praise God, that's what I'll be. It's Jesus. 
It's Jesus. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you can pray for that to happen right where you're at. I don't have magic pixie dust that I can share with you. But my God loves you. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm wearing a Scooby tie. If you ever remember the, the mystery machine for years and years, I wanted to build me a mystery machine. <laughs> Actually, I still do. I just don't have the time to do it. <laughs> but it's no mystery how to find Jesus. He stands knocking at your heart right now. All you have to do is let him in. If you're here this morning and you do know Jesus, then I'm going to say to keep your head high. Keep your, keep your spirits high. Yes, the world likes to try to slam and knock us down. But guys, I'm going to tell you, even from a secular viewpoint, the best thing I, I learned a long time, I didn't get this ugly by birth. You know, I had a rough <laughs> beginning. You square your shoulders and you put your faith in who you are in Christ. And regardless of what happens, in the end, you can hold your head high and say, I did the best of my ability to do what my God told me to do. And folks, there's nothing better you can have. The peace and the assurance of Christ saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Where are you this morning? You may need to repent. You may realize you have that gossiping tongue. You may realize you're the slanderer. You may realize there's debate. You may realize there's something that's come between you and your brother. And you, you're chomping at the bit to get home and call your brother and sister and say, I'm sorry. Whatever it is, praise God. Ask God's direction today. And then do what he calls you to do. If you don't know him, though, please. The battle is raging. And the way this battle is raging and the things I see happening in the world, I believe the time is drawing nigh that we need to get our hearts right with the Lord. Let the Spirit move in your life this morning. Be as happy as these kids. I wish I could keep chasing each other around the pole. But be happy knowing who your God is. In Jesus' name, let's stand. I want to lead us in a word of prayer. This altar will be open. If God's speaking to you this morning, please come down. But you can pray right where you're at as well. Yeah, don't step on the marbles. I lost my marbles. Let the babies come. Where, oh, the babies are gone. The babies can have them when they... Oh, yeah, that's right. Don't let the babies have them either. Amen. Well, let me say a word of prayer real quick, guys. Father God, I just come before you this morning and I praise you for who and what you are. And I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that your will be done in the hearts of your people. God, I know there are some out here that are struggling with sin in their life. They're struggling with inefficiency and inadequacy. God, let them see that if they know you, they are all they need to be. May they just grow in your grace. And Father, if there are those here today that do not know you, may this be the day they surrender their heart. And God, may as we as one body go forth into this community and into this world, face down all those things that are being said and just stand tall knowing we are what we are doing and being and are called according to your purpose. May your will be done, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. As we sing this morning, guys. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I just wanted you to ask.
world throws at you this week, this month, this year, the rest of your life. Remember, nothing compares to the glory we have in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good seeing everybody this morning. Praise the Lord for each one of you. Guys, keep looking up in all that you say and all that you do, and God's going to pull you through. Amen? Amen. Also, too, David, come here just a minute. <laughs> Principal's office. <laughs> Common occurrence, right? In the old days. In the old days. <laughs> Guys, uh, my brother's been called. He's going to be going up to Toronto, uh, uh, Canada. God has called him up there to share his testimony, but most of all to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So he's leaving out tomorrow. Keep him in your prayers this morning. Amen? Appreciate that. Absolutely. So everybody think about that. Amen. Gunny, it's good seeing you here this morning, brother. I really do appreciate seeing, looking out there seeing your face, man. Me too, man. Still ugly as ever, but it's good to see it. <laughs> he brought his dad. That's right. Hallelujah. He brought, Hallelujah. He brought his dad with him. Oh, is his dad with him? Oh, he is. Brother, it's good to see you as well. Hallelujah. Guys, keep looking up in all that you say and do and know that God's in control. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Keep, keep looking up. Brother Stephen Williford, would you close us in prayer this morning, brother?